When I was just a little stem cell, my parents sent me to Korean math camp, which was located in a church. I am not Korean. And so I listened to sermons in a language I did not understand, learning the Bible through translations done by teenagers looking for some summer money, and I'd come to realize. As long as I believed in our Lord, He would protect me. So every night I prayed to the Holy Spirit and asked Him to protect me from rabies. Because rabies is terrifying. If you thought that was an exaggeration, any time you ask Reddit about their most feared disease, rabies is at the top of the list. And for good reason. Once symptoms start showing, you're dead in a matter of days to weeks. And basically, nothing in our kit of modern medicine can help. But it's not just the overwhelming odds of death, it's the fact that as a disease of the nervous system, rabies will break down the brain, causing you to lose yourself before physically dying. It's tragic, but I'm not here to talk about how horrible rabies is. You can look up that nightmare fuel yourself. I'm here to talk about why rabies is so hard for the immune system to kill. It starts with the virus's tropism, or the cell type the virus prefers to infect. Rabies infects neurons, and that's a big headache for the immune system. While the cells of the immune system are free to roam the body and stamp out infections as they see fit, they're usually not allowed to interact with the nervous system. Why is that? Neurons are like really, really important. You need them to move, to sense, to feel, to think, you know, basic life-sustaining actions. And unlike so many other cells of the body, neurons can't replenish themselves after cell death. Why is that important? As good of a job as we do protecting the body, immune cells like us neutrophils often do our jobs with some level of collateral damage. And so neurons evolve to be a protected class of cells. They evolve to tune down their immune response so that we can't accidentally hurt them. How are nervous tissues protected if the immune system can't get in to fight germs that make it there? If we intercept threats before they make it to neurons, neurons can continue to do their job safely. When it comes to rabies, that strategy ultimately fails. Transmission of rabies happens through an animal bite something that can penetrate and cut through layers of tissue and circulation that are supposed to stop viruses from getting to neurons. At this point, we still have time on our side. Rabies is fatal once it gets to the brain. If we stop it before it gets there, we might be able to survive. Neurons are the longest cell types in the body. If you got bit on the leg, the distance for the rabies virus to travel to your brain would be the distance for you to travel from Florida to Sweden. We have time, but not as much time as you would hope. Rabies evolved a dastardly technique that hijacks the cellular transport system by binding to the protein dynein. Dynein is a protein that usually transports useful cell cargo from the periphery of the cell towards its body. Rabies evolved to stick to this dynein and hitch a ride up the neurons towards the brain. And dynein is no slouch either. It might be small, but it can actually move at a blistering 800 nanometers per second. At this speed, it takes just 14 days for rabies to move up a meter-long neuron. Still not impressed? If dynein were human-sized, that'd be 212 miles per hour or 342 kilometers per hour for our non-freedom-loving audience. That's as fast as a bullet train or an arrow or like eight Usain Bolts. What's implied here is the fact that the closer a rabbit animal bites you to the brain, the less distance it has to travel before you're dead. That may explain the variance in the incubation period where rabies-infected peoples show no symptoms. Rabies races along neuronal tracts, setting up areas of concentrated viral production centers called negri bodies. These negri bodies act as viral factories, pumping out more copies of the rabies virus within neurons. It's embarrassing to admit, as a neutrophil myself, but all of this viral setup happens without our knowledge or our interference. Like a child made to minimize their own psychological needs, neurons minimize their own distress signaling for the good of the body, even if they're in really bad shape. But not only are neurons already quiet signalers, the rabies virus inhibits neuronal interferon action, an immune signaler that would normally alert us to the site of infection. This double whammy of immune interference means that the infected neurons are nearly silent. There is one more desperate tool cells have when infected, and that is programmed cell death, or apoptosis. Apoptosis is the ultimate self-sacrifice. Through apoptosis, a cell undergoes a controlled demolition of itself. 
disintegrating into smaller bubbles, denying the virus further access to its virus-making machinery. These smaller bubbles can then be safely scooped up by cells of the immune system. But rabies may have evolved a way to take even this cellular nuclear option away from the neuron. Rabies strains that cause less apoptosis have been found to be more infectious in mice, implying that rabies could have evolved to stop apoptosis in its tracks. A fire burns for longer if you control its fuel source. Similarly, if rabies blew up neurons too early or too frequently, it might never make it to the brain without being cleaned up by the immune system. In a dastardly twist of fate, rabies evolved a way to protect neurons during incubation. What's that over the distance? Someone is approaching, and it's the killer T-cell. Killer T-cells may be small, but they pack a mean punch. We're saved. Infected cells display pieces of viral protein on their surface. When killer T-cells recognize and bind that protein, they release a potent cocktail of enzymes that trigger cell death, like manual override for self-destruction. Even though rabies is holding down the neuron's ability to pop, the help from the killer T-cells sends the death program over the edge. Is what I would say if rabies didn't have a deus ex machina level cheat code. While rabies stops apoptosis in neurons, research has shown that it encourages apoptosis in T cells. How this happens is still being worked out, but it's so, so messed up. Here the T cell comes, attempting to save the day, only to be uno reversed and blown up itself. All of this combined explains why rabies is an invisible death sentence. Not only can it be smuggled into the already quiet, vulnerable neurons, it evades detection by dampening their SOS signals. As neurons are being held hostage, they are even denied the grace of a righteous self-sacrifice. Even when immune cells locate and attempt to fight the rabies infection, it somehow turns the table on us. This buys time for rabies to make it all the way to the brain, breaking down a person's mind and control of their body. The cycle restarts as the virus makes its way to the salivary glands, allowing for transmission to begin again. By the way, did I mention the rabies virus only has five genes? Five genes is all you need for a 100% mortality rate after the symptoms show, apparently. There is hope though. Rabies is min-maxed for stealth. If the immune system detects rabies before it gets to the brain, it's no longer a death sentence. A timely vaccine trains the immune system so that they can better recognize a rabies infection. But wait too long and it's over. So we're in a bad news, good news, bad news situation. Bad news, rabies is 100% lethal when symptoms appear. Good news, administration of a rabies vaccine soon after infection has a really high success rate in preventing death. Bad news, having rabies vaccine on hand is expensive, and having to deal with rabies at all is scary. Countries with robust healthcare funding can afford to routinely keep rabies levels in the wild low, but countries that can't have to be on their toes. It kind of sucks. But I hope by watching this video, you've gained an appreciation for how deep the evolutionary arms race goes. All these back and forth adaptations is what makes learning biology so thrilling. Do you have a favorite pathogen? Let me know in the comments and I'll look into it. See you next time.